Good morning, church. How are you today? Today, I want to share with you about inner healing. If you were with us last week, you heard my wife share about physical healing, and today we're talking about inner healing because we as a church have an opportunity to take part in healing rooms, and many of those that will come to our healing rooms, and it'll be done through Zoom at this point digitally, uh, are going to not only be in need of physical healing and prayer for physical ailments, but also at the root of a lot of their issues is going to be inner healing. And we want to train you guys up as well as teach you and even walk you through your own issues as best as we can so that as you pray and seek the Lord, uh, he might be leading you to be a facilitator in one of these healing rooms that will be done. And if that's you, please let us know and we will provide you a little further training and discuss with you discuss with you these things. But beginning in Proverbs 4.23, says, Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Everything begins and ends with your heart. Inner healing begins and ends with the spiritual state of your heart. Scripture talks about that what speaks out of the mouth has its root in your heart. So everything that we deal with, everything that we are, has its root in our hearts. We can't have inner healing take place without a healed heart. Heart wounds are also the most dangerous type of wounds. One, they impact everything. They impact our thoughts, our actions, our deeds, our attitudes, our perceptions, and more, most importantly, our identity, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. But they impact every area of our life, how we see things, how we deal with other people, how we um, just handle ourselves in different situations, um, our attitude source of everything. And the second thing is, heart wounds go wherever you go. They go with you. It's not like you can leave them behind. You can't run away from them. You can only heal them or they will go where you go. If you're dealing with wounds that require any healing from one setting, just because you leave that setting does not mean those wounds are healed. You're going to need to deal with it. In church settings, many people are wounded in a church setting and figure if I go to another church, it'll be better. They're going to follow you where you go. And you need to get to the root cause of them. And the enemy would love nothing more than to infect your heart with his uh, inner wounds and diseases so that you will never be able to attain everything God has for you. Uh, it is God's desire that our inner wounds are healed. It's his desire. He desires to heal our inner wounds. Psalm 147.3 says, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He heals what's inside of you and not just heals it, but seals it up, binds it up, restores it, strengthens it, builds it, tightens it again so that there will be no cracks, nothing can get in anymore. Isaiah 53, 5, and this is very powerful, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. The key thing here is by his stripes we are healed. What are we healed of by his stripes? We are healed by wounds. He was wounded for our transgressions. Transgressions are sins, or actions. The external element. Wounds are external things. So if there's physical healing involved here, he, he heals our wounds. But he also was bruised for our iniquities. Iniquity is... The thing that produces the sin, what your tendency towards sinning would be. If you have a pornography addiction, watching porn is the sin, but the addiction itself is the iniquity, the thing that the sin comes from. And that's internal, intrinsic. So he wants to heal those things. By his stripes, we are healed of our uh, bruises, which are internal things. He was wounded for our transcriptions, and he was wounded for our iniquities. Wounds are internal. So he wants to heal the outside, and he wants to heal the inside. And First Peter 5, 7 says, Casting all your cares upon him, 
for he cares for you. So why do we need inner healing? Well, they can potentially affect, but I'm not limited to, your fears that you deal with, accusations, you're not good enough, you're not worthy of this, all those kind of things that go in our minds that affect us, shame, pain that we deal with. They can even affect physical illnesses and emotional illnesses because of the stress they cause on our, our bodies. Uh, obviously, depression and irrational behaviors and many, many, many more. Uh, towards the end, I'm going to share with you a little bit of a testimony but that I had to you know, deal with and how I walked through this inner healing process. There is an element sometimes, the demonic, within the wounds. Because when we are wounded, sometimes we open the door for demonic oppression of what we're dealing with and what we go through. And um, the demonic can affect all those things as well. Part of inner healing could be uh, just dealing with the demonic, casting it out, binding it, canceling its assignment. And just dealing in that specific area. And we'll get to that a little bit later. But this is not about um, uh, freedom ministry specifically in terms of demonization. But we're here talking about inner healing in general. So the, there's a word in the New Testament. It's sozo. Sozo in Greek happens 110 times in the New Testament. And this word encompasses everything about the healing, and the totality of the restor restorative ministry of Jesus. It means to be saved or rescued from under Satan's power and restored into the wholeness of God's order and well-being, the complete and perfection of who God is and what God has for you so we can attain the fullness of what God created us for. So the enemy came to tear, to destroy, to kill, to rip apart, to prevent our purpose and the plans that God has for us. He says, I alone know the plans I have for you. Plans to bring you a future and a hope. Jeremiah 29, 11. God has those plans in mind. And the enemy, through our external and internal wounds, wants to break through and prevent us from achieving the fullness of those plans. This word is used to mean saved from eternal punishment of sin. It's used to mean healed of diseases. It's also used to mean delivered from demonic oppression. It can also mean all three at the same time. It's also used as a verb to sometimes uh, describe someone who's raised from the dead because obviously they're fully restored at that point. To be sozo is to be completely saved Internal, external, uh, hope in Christ, salvation, everything from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. It's complete wholeness in perfection, in God's perfection. A couple of examples, Acts 4.12. Exam these examples are of a sozo meaning saved um, from eternal hell. It's salvation here. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved, or sozo. Romans 10.9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved, sozo. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, for by grace you have been sozo through faith. Uh, examples of, uh, of sozo meaning healed. Matthew 9, 22, Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter, for your faith has made you well or healed or sozo. And the woman was made well or sozo from that hour. Mark six fifty six. wherever he entered into villages, cities or countries they laid the sick in the marketplace and begged him that they might be just touch just that they might just touch the hem of his garment as many as touched him were made well sozo eel mark 10:52 then jesus said go your way your faith has made you well and immediately 
you receive this sign and follow Jesus on the road. Your faith has made you sozo. Your faith has made you healed, completely healed. Example of delivered. Luke 8.36. They also, who had seen it, told them by what means he had been he who had been demon possessed was healed, sozo, set free. Second Timothy 4.18, and the Lord will deliver me, sozo me, from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jude one five. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord having sozo the people out of the land of Egypt afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. Saved the people out of Egypt, or sozoed, or delivered. So this, this is a deliverance from oppression. The uh, Israelites were being oppressed by the Egyptians. They were as if they were uh, demonized and being oppressed by a demon. So sozoed and saved. A couple of examples of sozo meaning all three, saved, healed, and delivered. Luke 19, 9 through 10. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save which was lost. When Jesus said, Salvation has come to this house, Sozo has come to this house, it's the, this family, and the family includes the servants, those who work in the house, anyone who was under the roof, the household, was saved. And we know when people, you get a group of people together, you're not only dealing with salvation issues, you're dealing with internal healing issues and scars, you're dealing with physical ailments. So he's saying you all have been completely healed, renewed, salvation, healed physically, and healed from demonic oppression. You're healed, period. John 20, 21, Jesus said to them again, peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. This peace is a reference to the word sozo. When we talk about that shalom peace, nothing missing, nothing nothing broken, complete peace. When Jesus is sending them out, he's not sending out hurt people because when hurt people tend to hurt people because they are limited and they will only take people as far as they go, can go or they can handle. But heal people, heal people. So he's sending them out complete and whole, fully equipped, fully restored to represent him and do what he does. They have been sozo, healed, saved, delivered, and they can now go heal, save, and deliver other people. Jesus himself encompasses the complete healing nature of the Father. From head to toe, he encompasses Jesus' healing nature completely. Uh, we already shared Isaiah 53, 5. Who, who did this? It was Jesus. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace, our inability to have that shalom peace was upon him. And by his stripes, those things were healed. By his stripes, our transgressions were wiped away, inner healing. Our wounds were physically healed. And now we can get that place of peace that wasn't there before because of the turmoil we had and we were dealing with, whether it's inner healing or demonic oppression. Uh, we were lacking. There was something missing. There was something broken. But by his stripes, that's been made whole and we are healed. So I want to talk about real quick some keys to inner healing. Um, the heart of healing, inner healing is forgiveness. There more than likely will always be a measure of forgiveness that needs to take place. That could include forgiving others for something that you perceive as a wound that they have done to you, that some, some action, situation, circumstance that um, someone may have done, knowing or unknowing that wounded you. You know, I remember years ago uh, as a teenager, young teenager, I adored my dad, loved my dad. And I remember uh, loving to hold his hand and walking, even as a young teacher, 13, 14 years old, down the street. 
And I remember distinctly that very first time I went to take his hand as he and I were going for a walk down the road and he shoved my hand away. Now I realized what was going on. You know, I was older and, and that's kind of what he felt he needed to do. But that wounded me. I felt rejected by my father. Whether he realized he rejected me or not, I felt rejected. And that was a wound I had to deal with, a rejection. And I needed the Lord to come in and heal that wound of rejection. So forgiving others, how about forgiving ourselves? How many, you know, we have three voices in our head. And I'm not talking, you know, about multiple uh, personality disorder here. What I'm talking about is you have who, your, your own thoughts speaking to you, what you think. You have the voice of God telling you things. And you have the voice of the enemy speaking to you, and they all sound like the same voice. And how many times have we misrepresented the voice of the enemy as our own voice and have accepted the lies that he was telling us? You're no good. You can't do this. You're weak. You're not skilled enough. You're not mature enough. You don't have the ability. You don't have the credentials. You don't have the skill set. You know, you've done so much bad in your life. How, how could you even think that you were going to be good? Those kind of voices. Anything that does not affirm or build is going to come from the enemy. And we need to forgive ourselves for listening to those voices, accepting what those voices are telling us. Because when we empower the lie, believe the lie, we empower the liar. That's something Bill Johnson once said that I always um, just remember and has stuck with me. When we believe the lie, we empower the liar. And that lie a lot of times is about who we are. And what? Well, what we're able to accomplish and achieve in Jesus. And we start believing that we can't, and we forget that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So we need to forgive ourselves for those things. And there are those times we also need to forgive God because some of us at times have looked at God as a bad dad because of our perception of our fathers on earth. And sometimes we've had issues with that. And we just have to say, and I forgive you for this false perception I've had. It's a tricky one, but there may be those out there who might have to do that because based on their perception of where they are spiritually. The other keys to healing are how we see God. Acts 3.15, is he the author of life? First Peter 4.19, we see him as creator. Do we see him as the desire of all nations? Haggai 2.7, the faithful and true, the one who's always faithful. Revelation 19.11, the God who sees me, who's always there for me. Um, Genesis sixteen thirteen is he perfect love? First John four eight because our view of love in him can easily become distorted, but based on the inner wounds of our hearts. Is he the righteous judge? Isaiah thirty three twenty two or is he a condemning person who's going to continually beat you down? Is that how you see him for things you've done? That's what the enemy wants you to think. Is he Jesus our Savior? Luke two eleven. You know, or is he just somebody who's a good person, but I'm in such a bad place and I've been such a bad person, you can't save me. I'm beyond saving. Another key is how we see ourselves. Are we God's inheritance? Ephesians 1 8. Are we son and daughter of God? Second Corinthians 6 18. Are we children of light? First Thessalonians 5 5. Am I a city on a hill? Matthew 5.14. Am I a co-heir with Christ? Romans 8, 17. Am I chosen? Colossians 3, 12. Am I the part of the bride of Christ, his church? 2 Corinthians 11, 2. Am I part of his royal priesthood? 1 Peter 2, 9. Am I victorious? Do I walk in his victory? Revelation 3, 21. Am I dearly loved? Colossians 3, 12. These are all things how we see ourselves through his eyes. This is where identity comes in. And the biggest challenge of inner healing, next to forgiveness, and once we take care of forgiveness, is in this area of beginning to realize who I am as a son or a daughter of the Father. Son and daughter of God. 
that he just loved me and I, I can't be loved any more than he loves me because he got his love and he is the epitome of love. He is the pure essence of love. He can't love more than he already loves and he loves me already to death, literally, because he sent his only son to die for me. And my identity is in that, is in who Christ is in me and his spirit alive in me right here, right now, today. So how we see ourselves plays a big part in inner healing. Because as we begin to heal, we start to see ourselves as God sees us. We begin to see ourselves through his eyes. And we see how much we are loved, that we are called the apple of his eye, that we are his joy, that we were worth dying for, that we were worth doing everything he possibly can bring us into relationship with him not not just a relationship but intimate daily relationship with him he wants to be part of our life and wants us to be involved in what he does in his life he wants us to be partakers in his ministry he wants us to be just involved in the in his joys and the things that he does so how we see ourselves another key is how we hear God. And this is important because what does he say about me? What is he saying? What was he saying? Hurt from inner wounds impacts directly our ability to hear God. When hurt becomes a lens we see and hear from God, we don't see or hear him clearly. I shared a couple of times, my wife and I, that when, um, you know, for me, I, I tend to feel when God's speaking. I'm a feeler. I, I feel what he's doing in the room. I feel, you know, him. I, mean, I do see and I can hear him sometimes, but it comes out of me a lot of times as feeling. And when my heart is hurt, when I feel like someone hurt me, man, I have a really, really hard time hearing clearly from God. When I feel like somebody who I trusted let me down, and somebody um, has just wounded me inside. You know, I get so wrapped up in it that I have to really do work first and, and heal that wound immediately before I can clearly hear from Holy Spirit again. Because it, it's just the way God created me. It's, it's the way I work. Because I feel a lot from here. So when hurt becomes my lens, it be I start to get distortions. But when God cleans up the hurt, heals up those wounds, then I can hear and, and see clearly what he's saying. There's also generational curses involved in inner healing. Things that uh, might have been passed down from generation to generation. Things like if you're struggling with alcohol or different types of addictive behavior, um, that could be passed down. And those are things we, we'd have to deal with in inner healing. Um, I know from me and my family, uh, my mom struggled with depression now that I look back over the years. And I had that tendency and and leaning towards that because of that. And I had to do some work to deal with that uh, spirit of depression um, and work through that. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. And then also nurturing, uh, maintaining your healing. After you're healed, you know, we... My wife shared last week with uh, praying for physical ailments. A lot of times God heals, but then that spirit of infirmity wants to come back. So if he heals your knee and all of a sudden tomorrow you wake up and you feel that little twinge, you know, that's the enemy trying to come back. And that's what we say, not today, say, no, in the name of Jesus, I am that healed of the Lord. And I stand in your victory, Lord, that you healed me. And, and that's it. I'm not receiving this pain. I will not agree with this pain. So with that inner healing, when that happens, the enemy is going to try to attack because you filled out that wounded space with the things of God. He, and that thing wants to come back and take root in that space. So when it uh, comes back, say, nope, I stand there. And every time you see that person who wounded you, you bless them instead of curse them. You bless them and say, thank you, Lord, for the lessons that I learned from you through this experience. You bless that person. That's how you come against wound, inner healing, uh, inner wounds and bring healing to them. And I think back uh, whenever my wife and I argue and the enemy tries to bring me back 
to a wound that I had in my past that had to do with intimate relationships. And all of a sudden the enemy starts putting things in my head. She doesn't love you or she hates you or she doesn't really care about your needs. And ah, uh, and right there I have to stop and go, Lord, thank you for this woman that you gave me because she loves me. She is your daughter. She cares for me. She meets every one of my needs. She cares about uh, my deepest wounds. And Lord, I bless her. I bless her from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. I am thankful for her. I start blessing her. That's how the enemy tries to creep in and enter in and rob you of that healing. So nurture that healing. Bless God. Bless the person. Be thankful. Approach his throne always with a grateful and thankful heart. So now we, I've given you kind of an overview of what it is what inner healing is and how what God looks at it and how God wants to work in it and why. Now I want to actually walk you through steps. And if you are somebody who um, feels compelled and has that prompting from Holy Spirit to be a facilitator in one of our healing rooms, or even for your own sake or within your own family, this is important. This is good to know um, how to walk somebody through it. And this is just one simple process that we walk through people and I'm gonna all this is going to be on the church webpage in the sermons under the sermon um, so you will have the transcripts of this message and these steps as well so you would be able to just refer back to it anytime you need to do this but the first thing is simply go back to that place when you felt wounded now, we're not asking you to go back and relive a traumatic experience. We're asking you to just think back to that moment where that wound occurred, when that happened. For me, I struggled with depression most of my life till about four or five years ago. And when I went back to that memory, it took me to that place when I was 12 years old, eighth grade basketball team tryouts. I was one of the best ones on that court. But I remember every time I did something really good, making the shot, stealing the ball, you know, just a great play. And I would look to see if the coach was watching me, and the coach never once looked at me. So when the results came out, who made the team, I never made the team. Even the other kids in the eighth grade who tried out were shocked. I remember going home that day, so devastated and depressed, sad, feeling like a failure, and hearing you failed no matter how hard you tried. I went up into my attic, and we had an unfinished attic, shut the attic door behind me, and just cried. I don't know how long I cried, but I just cried. And that's when I opened that door to that enemy to come in and start telling me no matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, you're a failure. So I went back to that memory, wasn't reliving that experience, but I was just remembering when it first happened. So ask them to remember them. And when, when they remember that memory, when they go to that memory, simply ask Jesus, where were you in those moments? When I was up in that attic, Jesus, where were you when this happened to me? So if you're going through this now within each step, I'm just going to pause for a few seconds and let you work it through. And then again, you can always pause longer this video those of you who are watching this live uh, or uh, watching this on video. Where were you, Jesus? I remember for me, he said, I was right there with you, comforting you. I was crying along with you. I knew the hurt you're feeling and my arms were wrapped around you because you're not a failure. After that, Ask, Jesus, what lies did I come to believe from this experience? The lie for me was, no matter what you try, how hard you try, no matter what you do, you're not going to succeed. You're going to keep making mistakes. You're going to keep failing. You're going to keep messing up. You're not meant to achieve great things. And I accepted that for a long time. That was rooted in here and in here. Jesus, what lies did I come to believe from this experience? Next, third step, after you identify the lie, 
simply say, in the name of Jesus, I renounce the lie that I am a failure, or whatever that lie is. I renounce the lie that you fill in your blank. Step four, this is called the exchange. Jesus, what truth do you want to give me in exchange for these lies? And listen to what he tells you. What is the truth that the lie was hiding? And then once you have that truth, you simply say and declare, in the name of Jesus, I declare the truth that I am not a failure. I am more than a conqueror. I am meant for great things and I can do all things through Christ and give me strength. The Spirit lives in me. Whatever your truth is, I declare the truth that and you fill in the blank. Step five is forgive. Forgive the person or anyone responsible. In the name of Jesus, I choose to forgive. You fill in the blank for you forgive. Fill in the blank. For me, I had to actually forgive my eighth grade coach for not watching me, not seeing what I was able to do on the basketball hall. Step six is to renounce if there's any kind of demonic oppression here. Uh, renounce that spirit. Simply put, for me, it was in the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of depression. I cut off ties with it. I cancel its assignment. I renounce and you fill in the blank for you. Step seven. Simply say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to send your Holy Spirit to heal every emotion associated with this memory right now. I ask you, to restore my heart and bring new life out of this memory in Jesus' name. Take your time with it and just work it through. And then the final thing is just kind of, re it's, called, it's called a re-interview, but it's really go back to the memory and see how you feel. There's restoration and freedom. If you feel like Weights just lifted from you. God has carried that burden. Give him glory and praise his name. Be thankful to him for what he just did, how he released you from this burden. If there's still something there, just go back through that and do that process again. Holy Spirit will, he is faithful to, bring revelation and walk you through this healing process restore those things that the enemy tried to steal and take from you. You're too precious to God. You are way too precious to God. He will restore these things to you in Jesus' name. So I just bless you right now. If you uh, walk through those steps and did this as you are listening here today, I just bless what God and what Holy Spirit's doing in your life right now. I bless your healing, and I release more and more upon you. If you are one who has that stirring to uh, want to be trained in this more and um, just be involved in the healing room, uh, things that we will be doing through Zoom at this time while we are uh, not in person meeting, uh, I just bless that, and I bless that stirring that's within you, and please make sure you let us know one way or another. Contact us privately, and we just simply say, Jesus loves you. In the name of Jesus, you can be made fully whole. God bless you all.